Welcome to our course, Principles of Management. Two weeks ago, we started by looking at the introduction to the course. And in the introduction, we looked at several elements and factors. Most importantly, we introduced you to the framework called the PLOC. And by this time, you understand that the PLOC is a very fundamental framework to help you analyze um, what exactly manage managers do or what management is about. Last week, we focused on forms of management and we realized that management is a, a universal thing. The reason why you should study management is because managers are needed in all forms of organization, all sizes of organization, also all areas of the organization, be it uh, accounting, finance, manufacturing, maintenance, and also in different locations, different areas where the organization operates. So it makes management very fundamental to um, the success of organizations. Um, we also looked at three key elements that we can use to assess what managers do. One is the functions of management, right? And with the functions of management, we use the POLC. So every um, acronym in the POLC represents the function of management. One, we have planning. So planning is one of the functions of management. And the planning managers undertake several tasks. We also spoke about organizing as one of the functions of management. Then we spoke about controlling, leading and controlling. Today's discussion is going to focus on um, evolution of management theory, evolution of management theory. Now talking about theory, theory is a fundamental idea, fundamental assumption upon which knowledge has developed, upon which practice has evolved. And so we are talking about management now, with all that we understand about management, various forms of management, various managerial practices and outcomes of management, we can attribute all these to the theories that underpin management, right? So this discussion is going to introduce us to um, the fundamental theories, right? It doesn't mean that these are on, the only theories that you can find in management. There are several theories and people are actually propounding theories every now and then. But these are very fundamental to the study of management for you to understand how far management has come, right? Now, by way of learning outcomes, you should be able to describe some early management um, examples, explain various theories in the classical approach, discuss the development and uses of the behavioral approach, describe the quantitative approach, and also explain the various theories in the contemporary um, approach. By way of context, right, we are going to look at several parts in our discussion today. So first, we will take a dive into history to understand how, how management started or some of the fundamental things that can make us know that management is not a today's thing. Management has been in existence several, several, several years ago. Right. So we we'll take a dive into history. We'll also look at classical viewpoint of management. And then under it, there are several aspects that we are going to focus on. Then we also look at <clears throat> behavioral viewpoint, quantitative management viewpoint, and then uh, contemporary viewpoints of management. We might not be able to exhaust all these theories under the various uh, main categories, but we are going to cover uh, most of them, a lot of them. Now let's start by looking at the history or historical background of management, right? Historical background of management. 
Now, management has been practiced several years ago. In fact, till now, we can say that management has been in practice over 3,000 years. If we take an example of the Egyptians and the Chinese, we have the Egyptian pyramids. The pyramids uh, represent a very scientific discovery, right, in terms of mathematics, right, and science. But to mathematics and science is also the management because it has to do with the construction, how it was constructed, how tasks and people were arranged, right? So if we follow the PL, PL, uh, PLC, we can use it to understand that the construction of the pyramid actually um, had at the root of it a very sound management practice. And talking about the pyramid, for example, um, <clears throat> the project right was very massive, very huge um, project. And we are told that there were close to 100,000 workers, right? 100,000 workers who participated in the construction of the, um, the pyramid. And the construction lasted a period of about 20 years, okay? Just to construct one pyramid, it took about 20 years, okay? So just look at it, look at the number of years involved, sustainability, right? And also look at the people, the number of people involved, 100,000 people is what we are talking about here. Um, those of us who follow sports, recently there was the World Cup, right? And we see how um, uh, 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 the, the World Cup city, right, Qatar, the various stadia that they constructed, the number of people who were on site working, all of that. We have seen some modern constructions like the uh, Notre Dame, right? It was then uh, quite recently and it's still under construction. So many people are involved in these constructions. But just to think of it, we are talking about a project that lasted 20 years and had 100,000 people working in there. That's some questions you would have to come to mind. For example, who told each worker what to do? Who ensured that there were uh, enough, you know, stones at the site to keep workers busy? 100,000 workers. You would say that, oh, um, most of the people were not working, but I don't think this is true. I don't think this would be possible, right? Else they wouldn't achieve what the outcome that they achieved. So we are talking about who works where at what time, at what point in time, who is supposed to do what, and also how do we ensure that we have enough materials on site? So we're talking about the planning, talking about the organizing, talking about leading and controlling, everything um, was found in there. Now, for those of you who have a little knowledge about the Bible and the account of the, of the Jews in Egypt, right? They were asked, they were, they were taskmasters who ensure that the Jews, the Israelites, they were always working, okay? So you can see some division of labor, right? Because taskmasters would mean that people were grouped. So each group will have a master over them. And they were to ensure that the people did whatever they had to do at the right time and, and also the right task was, was being done. So you can understand how management, you know, was at the root of this. And this is, this is something that uh, happened, you know, several, several, several centuries ago. <clears throat> We're also talking about the, the Great Wall of China. Most people go to China, they go to the Great Wall. People try to walk the length of the Great Wall, and it's almost an impossible thing. You have to use some vehicle to be able to do that, right? Because we are told that the Great Wall covers um and covers a, a length of what twenty one thousand plus kilometers. 
21,000 plus kilometers. That's the length of the wall, right? And for the Great Wall, they used 2,000 plus years to construct the Great Wall. 2,000 plus years. So just think about sustainability, right? Fatigue. Look at the length of the project. How were people mobilized? How were resources mobilized? How did they ensure that the people were motivated enough? In whichever way you might look at it, you might say, okay, maybe the people were under some form of compulsion. It's part of leadership. Leaders don't always <laughs> encourage, you know, sometimes leaders also use some kind of force to get people to do what they are supposed to do based on um, rewards and punishments, right? <clears throat> So that is also um, a very important thing that can help us understand how management has, has evolved over, over the period. Now, talking about modern um, economics, so we have, <laughs> sorry, we have the great Adam Smith who wrote the book, The World of Nations in 1776, right? And in this book, the idea is that nations can get what we call economic advantage in the division of labor or job specialization. Nations can get economic advantage in the division of labor or job specialization. So what it means is that if you look at Ghana, for example, okay, there are resources that we have in abundance. We have gold and all these resources, mineral resources, and some other natural resources that we have, like the gold and all that. We have also trees, the tick, tick tree, that is used to um, erect electric poles all over the nation. So, if you want economic advantage, then rather focus on the thing that you are good at and also utilize the resources that you have to produce. Then you can sell to those who don't have and you also buy what they have. Okay, right. So division of labor or job specialization helps with what economic advantage. So when you go to different organizations, they focus on different things. And sometimes the things that they do are based on a certain skill set that they have. They possess some skill set. They have some caliber of, 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 of human resource. And because of that human resource, they are able to what, produce the kinds of goods and services that will help them to gain economic um, advantage. Right. Now, so that... That work of Adam Smith is a very fundamental um, idea when it comes to economics or when it comes to management. But then we come to the era of industrial revolution, right? The era of industrial revolution. And under the industrial revolution, now we are shifting because we want to produce more. We want to satisfy more needs, okay? <clears throat> Workers are also clamoring for more. So how can we get more from the people, right? How can we produce more goods and services? So machines uh, substituted human labor. So factory work now became the idea. If we can produce more goods and services to satisfy the masses, to ensure that maybe in terms of food production, there is no hunger. So we produce a lot of food in camps. Right. How can we do that? We need to use machines. Okay, so we need more of machines than humans at this point, right? So they created large organizations, and for these large organizations, they needed management. Okay, they needed management. Now, I'm going to show you the major approaches, the major approaches to management, and we can understand this from five distinct and also interrelated dimensions. Okay. So we have the historical background. We will look at early examples of management like I've given you, Adam Smith and the Industrial Revolution and the Asian 
um, the ancient examples of PG-10 <clears throat> in China. Then we also have the classical approaches. So here we are looking at scientific management. We are looking at what we call general administrative theory. Then we transition to quantitative approach where we also look at the Eurora approach, contemporary um, approach. Right. So we are going to take some of these and discuss them in detail. We have already looked at the historical background, so we cannot um, study management now without understanding the historical background. Look at the early examples of management. Look at the work of Adam Smith and his recommendation, the fact that if you want to gain economic advantage, and of course, organizations ensure that they put in strategies that will give them competitive advantage. Competitive advantage is another way to say economic advantage because they want to be market leaders um, in some way or in some form. So now let's quickly look at the various um, examples and uh, um, <clears throat> some of the categories. So if we take scientific management, scientific management is part of the classical approach to management, right? So here, there was a formal study of management, and this began in the 20th century. Then people now started studying management. So all along, as we spoke about um, Adam Smith, and we spoke about uh, the Asian the examples of, of Egypt and China, management was not being studied as a course, as a program. Right? But in the 20th century, people started studying management because we have to make clear sense of how we work, right? So emphasis was on rationality, right? Making workers and organizations efficient, okay? And in this, the person who can be um, described as the father of scientific management um, <clears throat> was the person of Frederick Winslow Taylor. So, Frederick Taylor is considered the father of scientific management. So when we say scientific management, we are saying it's a point in history, in management history, where management was formally um, studied. But besides Frederick Taylor, there are other people who have made invaluable contributions to um, management or scientific management in various forms, right? when we're looking at some of these um, examples. So <clears throat> under the scientific management, we're using scientific methods to define the one best way for a job to be done. Because remember, we are talking about rationality. We are talking about making workers and organizations efficient. So if we want to make workers and organizations efficient, then what is that best way for jobs to be done? It means that we put people at the right place, okay, on the right job, give them the correct tools and equipment to work. We also standardize method of doing the job, okay? So last week we were discussing whether management is a science or a art. So we standardize. Once we standardize, there is a procedure, there is a method, there is an approach, specific approach to do something. Right, for example, when you are receiving a guest into the organization, there is a way, standard procedure to do that, right? Maybe they need to uh, report at the security gate, they need to go through security check, they need to sign in their name, they need to get a name tag, um, the person to whom they are going to see must be informed and all of that. So that procedure is established. And every time we have to use that procedure so that we can be sure of the outcome, the efficiency that we want, right? It doesn't end there, but also providing economic incentive to the worker. We want the worker to be more efficient. If I am more efficient, it means that I am producing more and I'm reducing the cost. What do I get in return? So scientific management brings in the idea of order, but also compensation, right? So you can see some motivation in there. Now, beyond the work of Frederick Taylor was the work of these uh, psychologist, right, husband and wife, Frank and Lillian Gilbert. Now, these were construction uh, contractor and psychologists, and they studied work to eliminate 
extreme efficient hand and body motions. So they invented what we call the micronometer, right? Micronometer, okay. So these were used to help remove inefficiencies by the way the hand and the body motions work. When you go to some industrial organizations, right, you will find that um, various activities of the organization have been automated. It comes from this, it comes from the work of Frank and Lillian, uh, because they study the workers in the, in the, in the construction site. When you look at the body and the hand, where the inefficiencies are, can we put a device there to control this part, right? For example, if you are, you are working in the pure water factory and you have to use your hand to be, you know, capping the bottles, Right. Let's imagine how many bottles you are going to produce and you, every one of them you have to be carpet, turning your hand around, right? At that point, fatigue gets in. So is it possible to put a machine that can help to eliminate that inefficiency which we might experience along the way? Okay. So if we are summarizing um, Taylor's principles, we can summarize them in these four. Develop a science for each element of an individual so to replace old rule of thumb methods. Okay, so this is how we do it kind of thing. Scientifically select and then train, teach, and develop the worker. Heartily cooperate with the worker so as to ensure that all work is done in accordance with the principles of science that has been developed. And divide work and responsibility almost equally between manager, management and workers. Management does all work for which it is better suited than working. So these are the principles that uh, Frederick Taylor espoused. Now, so be, be, besides the scientific management principles, which are part of the classical management approach, right? We also have the, what we call a general administrative theory that was also uh, propounded by Henry Fayol, Henry Fayol. So this is a, a, French, a French scholar. He believed that the practice of management was distinct from other organizational functions. Okay, so he developed the principles of management that applied to all organizational situations. Okay. So we are going to look at the principles. There were actually 14 principles. Right, so he was concerned with first line managers and the scientific method. So um, what was the activities of all managers? And so for us to know what managers, all managers should do, came up with the 14 principles, okay? So here they are, uh, division of work, authority, discipline, unity of command, unity of direction, Subordinate, subordination of individual interest to group interest, um, remuneration, centralization, um, scalar chain order, equity, stability of tenure of personnel, initiative, and esprit de, co de corps, right? That's team spirit. These are the 14 principles, okay? And for you, as people who are studying management, you need to have these things at your fingertips. It's very important. Okay, there are many things we are going to discuss in our course, but these are things that if you say you have studied management, principles of management, then the work of Henry Fayol, okay, is very fundamental. And so you should know these, uh, these principles, okay? You should know these principles. If we look at um, some of the elements in the principles, okay? So for example, <clears throat> division of labor, right? Because we are talking about general administrative theory. If we're talking about administration, we are talking about bureaucracy, okay? So a bureaucracy should have these things, right? Division of labor, like bring jobs down to simple, routine, and well-defined task. High authority, hierarchy, okay? So we, we should know who is in command. We should know who has more power. Looking at the organogram, okay, looking at the organizational chart, we should know who is the boss, we should know who reports to, to who in the line of work. 
okay, who controls which people in the organization, then formal selection, right? Formal selection. So on what basis are people selected for the organization? And also talking about formal rules and regulations, talking about policies of the organization. So is there a written um, rules and standards operating procedure by which things are done? Or as I see it fit, as I deem it fit, as I think it right, I do. Okay, so where, where do we stand? Organizations should have clear written uh, rules and standards. Then in personality, okay, so uniform application of rules and controls. Here we are talking about equity, we are talking about fairness, right? Procedural justice, okay? Then there is also uh, career orientation, right? So all these are very important in a bureaucratic system. So we're talking about bureaucratic management theory and the work of Max, Max Weber, right? <laughs> the work of Max uh, Weber is also very fundamental. Okay, so this theory that was developed emphasizes uh, authority based on an ideal type of organization. So here we are talking about ideal. What is ideal? Okay. Ideal type of organization is an organization that has a bureaucratic um, way of doing things. Okay, so it, it emphasizes bureaucracy, right? Now, so an ideal bureaucracy did not exist in reality. However, bureaucracy is a form of organization characterized by the division of labor, clearly defined hierarchy, detail rules, right? So we cannot have something that is ideal, but we can use some characteristics to say that if we see these signs, then that is what a bureaucratic organization, okay? So as we go through this, um, I will ask you to give some examples of organization that you think, right? <laughs> uh, kind of bureaucratic organizations, okay? Then also, we emphasize uh, rationality, predictability, impersonality, technical competence, and authoritarianism, okay? So these are German sociologists, right? He developed this theory, okay, to promote authority structures. Okay, so as you can see, all the issues that have been raised is just to ensure that you always know what is being done. Things are not done any way, anyhow, okay? Things are done in a proper way. Right. So these are the ideas of what of 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 Weber, right? Max Weber. We are now going to look at quantitative management approach, right? Quantitative management approach. Now, this can also be called operations research or management science. Okay, and this comes from mathematical and statistical methods that have been developed. Okay, to solve World War II military logistics and quality control problems. So the focus is on managers improving decision making by applying statistics. So again, when we were discussing whether management is a science or it's an art. Now, if we're talking about statistics and we're talking about optimization models, we're talking about information models and computer simulation, these are scientific, right? But these are very procedural and well laid out approach to taking decisions, okay? So under the quantitative management approach, the point is that if you can make best decisions, you need numbers, okay? You need tools, models, right? Optimization models. You need information models and computer simulations to help make appropriate or better decisions. Because we are talking about the world war. You don't want to take a decision that is not precise. You want decisions to be on point, okay? So that is what quantitative management um, exposes or tries to harness, uh, tries to preach. Let's look at organizational behavior, right? Organizational behavior. So organizational behavior is also one of the um, theories, okay, it's one of the theories under the 
behavioral approach. Okay. One of the theories under the behavioral approach. Now, organizational behavior, or we call it the OB, okay, is looking at actions of people at work. So people are the most important asset of an organization. But OB does not only espouse action of people. It looks at people as individuals, it looks at people as groups, and then it looks at systems, the structure of the organization. Okay, so when we say the OB model, we are looking at individuals, we are looking at groups, and also we are looking at what? the structure of the organization. That is how we understand OB. Okay, so these are some of the early proponents, right? People who contributed to the study of OB. We have Robert Owen, we have uh, Hugo Minsterberg, Mary Parker Follett, and Chester um, Bernard. All these are people who con contributed to the study of OB. Right. So OB research, right, has inspired managers today because it helps managers to know how to motivate, how to lead, how to build trust, how to work in teams, how to manage conflict because it's about the people. Okay, the behavior of the organization is derived from the people, whether individual or groups, or also whether the structure of the organization itself. And so, managers through this uh, this um, uh, uh, call this theory, right, the OB theory, are able to start in motivation, know how to motivate, know how to lead, build trust, know how to develop teams, work in teams, and also how to manage conflict, how to negotiate, and all of that. It talks about leadership, talks about politics, talks about power and impact in organizational settings. Okay. All right. So these are the various contributions of the proponents, the people who supported um, OB, right? The advocates like uh, Robert Owey, Hugo Mustabe, Mary Parker Follett, and also Chester uh, Bernard. All these have made very um, invaluable contributions to the advancement of organizational behavior. Now we are going to look at the Hawthorne studies. Okay, the Hawthorne studies. So this is connected, or this was conducted at the Western Electric Company Works. Um, it initially started as a scientific management experiment. The last time some of you were saying, Okay, management, we don't do any experiment. We actually do, right? So this is an example. And this was led by Elton Mayo, okay, Elton Mayo and Associate. Now, the idea is when employees are given special attention, productivity is likely to change regardless of the state of working conditions. Pay attention to this. When employees are given special attention, productivity is likely to change regardless of state of working conditions. Informal work groups and social environment greatly influence productivity and stimulated an interest in human behavior in organizations. So you can see that <coughs> Our fund studies are part of the world, the uh, behavioral uh, studies, right? Behavioral studies. Now, so from all these experiments that were conducted between 1924 to 1932, what were the findings? One, productivity expected unexpectedly increased under imposed adverse working conditions. So they impose some adverse. Adverse means something negative, right? The conditions were not favorable. Okay. So these conditions were imposed and they realized that productivity increased. This is an experiment. Okay. Now the effect of incentive plans was less than expected. So we normally expect that oh, when people are getting some good incentives, some good packages and all that, it will really make them give more. 
But here in this experiment, it was discovered that the effect was less than expected, meaning that it didn't contribute as much as <clears throat> was expected. Now, the conclusion from this experiment, okay, called the Halton study, was that the group, social norms, group standards, and attitudes more strongly influence individual output and work behavior than do monetary incentives. Maybe you say that, well, this cannot be the case in Ghana because hey, we all want money. But, but sometimes that is the fact and it happens, okay? It happens in many places, right? When people are in a group, sometimes it's not the money, it's what the group is saying. Okay, so group norms, group standards and attitudes more strongly influence individual output and work behavior. For example, uh, we as university lecturers, we have the UTAC. When UTAC declares a, a strike, whether you give me big money or not, I'm going to be on strike. Okay, so here we, it's a social thing, right? So it combines the um, sociology and also psychology. Okay, in this case, looking at how people will respond, looking at how people behave. Maybe if you are to deal with me as an individual, I might respond positively because we all, economics will tell you that we all take decisions at the margins, right? Incentives, I mean, rational thinker, rational person, when there is good incentive, I will go for it. But then when we are in groups, we, we behave differently. Okay, we behave differently. So this is a very um, important experiment, right? <clears throat> now, uh, I'll leave you to read now about this quality uh, manager, which is part of the quantitative uh, approach to manage. Now, so talking about the quantitative techniques, as we saw earlier, how to use uh, simulation, how to use optimization, how to use information models to improve decision making. Um, the total quality management is a philosophy um, devoted to continual improvement and responding to customer needs and expectations. That's what total quality management is about. And the Japanese are very good with this. And that's what it comes from them, right? <coughs> So no wonder, we are not surprised that now the automobile they are all over, especially in Africa, because they have been able to consistently improve and develop, and now they are given a very efficient automobile in terms of fuel consumption, in terms of uh, spare parts, okay, the cost of spare parts, maintenance, right? Now, this also, focuses on how we serve customers, okay? How do we serve customers? So the customers are very important because it is based on their expectation that we seek to improve. We want to give them the best, okay? We want to give your customers an experience, a service that they can't get anywhere, right? So anyone who interacts with organizations, products or services internally or externally are customers. Now, the point is this, you have two types of customers, internal customers and external customers. Now, internal customers could be your colleague worker in the sense that when I do some work on my desk, I have to transfer that work to another desk because it's not a final, okay? It's a part of the process approach, mm -hmm. process approach. So from one desk, for example, I need to take student registration. After the registration, I need to send it to the lecturer so they know the number of students who have registered for the course. Then they know how to deal with the student, right? If I don't ensure that the registration is properly done, it's going to affect the work of the, of the next person. And once the lecturer's work is affected, he cannot give the students the quality uh, teaching and learning experience that they, they so desire. Okay, so that is understanding, you know, quality management from the internal perspective. Externally, most of the time we are looking at customers outside. 
people who are coming to buy our goods and services or um, external stakeholders, the people that we do business with, right? So sometimes we tend to treat the people outside more and much better than the people inside, but that is wrong. If you can give the people outside a very good experience, good products and services, you must as well think about the people inside. Serve the needs and interests of the people inside well so that together we can serve our customers in the most appropriate, appropriate way. So for continual improvement, we're looking at it's possible with what accurate measures. Okay, so intense focus on customer observation, concern for continual improvement, process focused, like I just spoke about, improvement in quality in everything the organization does. Okay, accurate measurement, empowerment of employees. So if we can achieve uh, continual improvement, these are the various aspects and elements that we need to pay attention to. Now, the last part of our discussion today is going to look at the contemporary um, approaches, right? There are two <clears throat> approaches that have, that have emerged from the con contemporary management perspectives. One is the systems approach, and the other is contingency approach. Systems approach and contingency approach. Looking at the systems approach, we are looking at a set of interrelated and interdependent parts arranged in a way that produces a unified whole. By systems approach, we are talking about interrelated and interdependent parts arranged in a manner that produces a unified whole. Let me give you an example. When you take your mobile phone, okay, now, the mobile phone has so many parts to give us a whole, a system, okay? So this tool is a system of communication or a system of doing something. You can use it for so many things, okay? So take your phone as a system. Now, various parts and various functions come from different sources. The APBs that we use on the phones, they come from different sources. <clears throat> the physical part, <clears throat> like the, the LED screen, the camera, the sound system, the cover, all these things come, come from different organizations, okay, even the chip, right? So my system, we are trying to achieve interrelated and interdependent arrangements so that we can get this unified product. So how is it that the SIM card or the, the Intel, okay, the chip that is coming from, let's say, Taiwan, okay, then you have the screen, the screen coming from, let's say, the software development, especially for Apple, is coming from the United States. Some parts are coming from Japan. Other parts are coming from, and you have the labor that is coming from China, okay. They all come together in a unified in an arranged manner to give us this product and you use it and you are enjoying the experience of using <clears throat> the, the kind of phone that you have, okay? We have a closed system and we have an open system. Now, so by closed system, you are looking at, uh, these are not influenced by and do not interact with their environment. So the system, everything is internalized. Everything is within. And some organizations work like that. In the automobile industry, some organizations were doing that. They produce everything by themselves. I, I have forgotten specific example, but I think Tesla, right? Tesla and maybe previously um, some other automobile companies were doing that. They produce everything by themselves, apart from the raw material. In fact, some of them, they even try to you know, get their own factory for managing the raw materials themselves. So some organizations do that. Other organizations do not do that, okay? They use open systems, so they interact 
with their environment by taking in inputs and transferring them into outputs that are distributed into their environments. So they take up their inputs from elsewhere. Okay, so I'm buying, let's say, I'm buying uh, cocoa beans from uh, Western region. Then I buy sugar from, sugar from India. I buy other, you know, um, food additives, maybe from Europe. Then I'm able to produce meal. Okay, so that is what comes out, right, into the environment. So that is a system's thinking. It could be, it could be closed or it could be uh, open. It depends on what the organization is seeking to achieve. Okay, so <coughs> can look at the, how the system works. Okay, so we have the um, employees, the management activity, the technology and the operations methods. Right? That is the transformation process. That is what transforms the raw material, the input, the human resources, the capital, the technology, the information. Then we can have various products and services, various financial results, various information, various human results. So the system, right? The system okay, is within the transformation process, right, the transformation process. And sometimes we are saying that the system could, could, could incorporate the inputs, okay, the inputs and outputs could be part of the system, right, whether in a closed or in an open system. Now, so besides the Systems approach is the contingency approach as part of the contemporary approaches to management. Contingency, meaning that it's situational, okay? So here the idea is that there is no universally applicable set of management principles. Meaning that you can say, okay, this is what management is. Whether your company is small or big, this is what you have to do. Whether you are MTN, or you are Tigo, or you are Vodafone, or you are uh, Best Point, or maybe you are this week, right? Or maybe uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, advertisement on TV now. So maybe uh, uh, there is this, uh, this is it, uh, tomato paste advert. I've forgotten the name, right? So, if we want to, as it were, if we want to implement a certain management, right, is there a universally accepted set of management principles that goes for all? So the point is that organizations are individually different. They face different situations, okay, which we call contingency variables, and they require different ways of managing them. So that is what contingency approach to management seeks to uh, espouse. Then <clears throat> we also have the the theory, theory Z. Okay, theory Z. So theory Z is also considered the Japanese management, right? Japanese management. Here is an integrated model of what motivation. Okay. It emphasizes complete socialization of members to achieve individual and group goal. So if you go back to earlier discussion that we had, you can see that this has a connection with the, um, <coughs> with the behavioral uh, theories, okay. But here, right, um, the theory assumes that large organizations are human systems. And so the effectiveness of these complex, large and complex organizations depends on the quality of what the humanism used, which calls for right management support, well-being of all and self-confidence. So these are the assumptions when we're talking about the regime. So the regime was proposed by William Osh. Okay, the early ages. There are some limitations of this theory, as you can see. Now, what what do these 
what does this theory, you know, kind of emphasize? Okay, it's talking about mutual trust, strong bonding, employment involvement, uh, employee involvement in decision making, free from organizational structure, coordination, informal control, then human resource development. Now, if you look at these things carefully, right, the idea is that it shifts or it puts responsibility at the door of the employee. It's like the employee is kind of empowered to think that this is for me. So how I need to make to do it the best way is the most important thing. If you look at the issues here, it's talking about mutual trust. Okay. So we all know that no, this is something that we have to work it together. We need to do this together. It is ours, it belongs to us. Because for strong bonding, whether you are the boss or you are the subordinate, we are bonded to each other. Talks number what? MBO management by objectives. Decision making should involve the employees because <laughs> there is mutual trust. They are not different from us. The way we want the organization, they also want it the same way. We all have equal interest in the organization, right? Free from organizational structure. Okay, so here it's not like, okay, so you are the boss, you are this. No, it's like we are all, you know, together. There's coordination, there is informal control, right? Because if there is no organizational structure, then there is no formal control, right? And also human resource development. So I'm saying that if you look at these elements carefully, which are being espoused by this theory, then it tells us that there is more <coughs> responsibility on the subordinate, on the employees. The employee should assume more role in the organization, right? So you don't like how we behave in Ghana when people are. Uh, Doing public service, right? Then there is a saying that, oh, uh, if it is the work of the government, we don't carry it on our heads. Maybe you carry it on our shoulder, meaning that you don't have to take things too personal, right? And this is the mindset which which are, which is destroying how we work, okay, in our parts of the world. And also, that mindset, but in the Japanese management, okay, once you join the organization, right? The, the organization is part of you. It's your home. It belongs to you, whether it's your family business or not. Once you join, you are part of it. That's why we talk about all these uh, issues under the theory. Uh, okay. Now, um, for the wrap up, okay, let's briefly look at some few things around you. Total quality management, which we mentioned earlier. So we said that the whole thing is, is rooted in what customer satisfaction. Okay. And if organizations will achieve competitive advantage or long-term success, it is true satisfying the customer. Right. Now, in the effort that we make towards TQM, all members of an organization participate in what improving processes, improving products, improving services, and also improving the culture in which in which what they work. This is achieved through various <coughs> quality tools. There are so many quality tools that are used. Okay, so we have what the problem array tool diagram, we have the face form diagram, we have the checklist process flow, diagram, scatter diagram, histogram, control chart, so many sampling, acceptance sampling, random sampling, reliability, design of experiments, like, like we saw uh, earlier in the Althorn uh, experiment, process analysis tools, quality function deployment, the ISO series, benchmarking, total productive maintenance, all these are tools that are used. Okay. All these are tools that are, are used, all right? So you can see some various elements or dimensions of um, total quality management. 
process thinking as much as I should do that and we commit and think we can manage all this. Now, if you look at the history of Uta Palace King, Toyota and other companies, they have had several records okay, in their history. And I'll give you some uh, brief statistics when we wrap up the section. So if you look at Toyota, for example, right, in 2009, that is 2009, okay, um, there were issues with what? Gas pedal, okay, gas pedal. And also, um, so they, they, they did a record, specifically 29 September 2009, because of what? Gas pedal, so they did record. Then there was also entrapment by floor mats. Now, this is quite long. So, 2007 to 2010, the Camry that they had, 2005 to 2010, the Toyota Avalon, 2004 to 2009, Toyota Prius, 2005 to 2010, Toyota Tacoma, 2007 to 2010, Toyota Tundra, right? All these are series of cars that Toyota have has had to do a record because of what faulty parts. Now, why do they do these records? It is part of what the quality management approach. If you don't do that, the customer gets to know that you are taking us for granted, okay? That is going to, you know, affect your business in a very serious way. Um, I think five or six years ago, there were, there, 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 there were these lots of talk all over the internet against Samsung. The fact that uh, I think Samsung S or so, people were saying that the battery, you know, the battery uh, can catch fire. And there were a lot of videos all over the internet. I, I, I actually experienced it in one airport outside the country where somebody had that phone and they, they did not allow him to travel with the phone. He had to leave the phone there to go and come for the phone. Or you leave it and go. Otherwise, you can't board the flight because of this news. So if the organization is focused on total quality management, whenever issues come up, they have to quickly take steps to first do a record so that the customers have more confidence. People are still buying to wood because it's still fuel, fuel efficient. It's very easy to get a pass and it's not too costly. Okay. But if issues come and you keep quiet, right, it's going to aggravate. It's going to go higher and higher and it's going to affect you. That's why we're saying that TQM is at the root of what? Long-term success of the organization. Right. And in that competitive advantage will be there. The company must have it in mind to what to satisfy their customers in the long term. In the short term, it might not be possible, but in the long term, we can take a lot of things. We can do a lot of things to help uh, stabilize your customer base. And once you have a stable customer base, you are sure to have um, success in the organization. Okay, so this is where we end our discussion on the evolution of management. What we have said is that management began from somewhere. There is an ancient background to management, right? Looking at the examples of the Egyptian pyramid and also the Chinese Great Wall. Next time when you travel to China, go to Beijing and take a tour to the Great Wall. It's a, it's a site that many people go to when they visit uh, China. Right, but then the Egyptian pyramid has also been around, it's, it's contributed a lot to mathematics and science. Right, so these are very, very fundamental to the study of management because imagine the task <laughs> that way involved. Right, I'm talking about over 100,000 people over 18 years, we are talking about over 2,000 years to build a wall. Right, about 21,000 kilometers wall. This is massive. But besides that, we are saying that management has evolved, okay, from uh, scientific management, which we saw the battle of scientific management by Frederick Taylor, 
来一直在聊，他说是你的 work of 呃，法国呃 ，William Gilbert， right？ All these people， we have also seen various approaches， classical approach， we have seen quantitative approach， we have seen a behavioral approach and also contemporary approach to management。And when we understand this, right, and you are operating in an organization as a manager, you understand people, you understand yourself, you understand work processes, knowing that ultimately you want to have a productive environment, you want to have efficiency in organizational processes and organizational outcomes. Our next discussion is going to look at managerial environment. See you uh, next time. Right.